Hello, my name is Alexei, and today I'm going to talk about serving deep learning models in production. Um, first, a few words about me. Um, I have uh, I've been working as a software engineer professionally for more than ten years, and six of them I spent uh, working with machine learning systems. Um, right now, I work as a lead data scientist at OLX Group, um, and. Uh, this is, uh, you can see the logo of OLX Group on this picture. Um, OLX Group is a company, is a group of uh, online classifieds companies. So maybe you've heard of some of them. Um, Avita, OLX, Letgo, and uh, a couple of more brands. Um, and uh, the main idea of online classifieds is a place uh, where you can share, where you can sell something, where you can buy something. So this is uh, um, OLX India. This is the place where people can come and sell things they don't need anymore, or people where people can uh, come and buy things, um, use things for cheaper prices. Um, OLX India is one of the biggest uh, websites uh, we have. Uh, there are a couple of others, um, like OLX Ukraine, OLX India, and we uh, also have a presence in. Uh, Africa, Asia, South America. Um, so on this, uh, 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 on this slide you see OLX Ukraine. Uh, and uh, typically for online classifieds, uh, pictures are very important. So when you want to uh, buy something, when you browse through the catalog, you see many, many pictures of things. Um, and uh, having good pictures is very important for um, for deciding whether you want to learn more about something, whether you want to contact the seller uh, and ask uh, to, to arrange uh, a meeting to buy something. Uh, on OLX we have a lot of images. 10 million images are uploaded um, by our customers daily. And the challenge we are going to talk about in um, this presentation is how to apply deep learning models to 10 million images per day. Um, so in this talk, we'll first uh, discuss motivation. So why are we doing this? Why do we need it? Uh, then uh, we'll uh, spend some time uh, talking how we train models. Um, and then after training is done, uh, there comes the next step, how to actually serve the model. Um, and we'll talk about the evolution of model serving that we had uh, at OLX. So how we started initially, how it evolved, what was the uh, original architecture? Um, what was uh, uh, what are, were some drawbacks of this architecture? How we changed it uh, and simplified. Mm. So imagine you you have a car and you want to sell it. Um, so what you do is you go to Olix, you create a listing, fill in some details. Um, and then you take a picture, and what happens next? This picture, uh, this picture, uh, is uploaded to uh, our image hosting. Our image hosting is based on S3. S3 uh, is a service that, uh, in AWS for storing files. So this is basically a thing where you can put files, and then you can get files back. And every day, uh, 10 million uh, images are uploaded to these image hostings. This, this image hosting. So it means that we have billions and billions of pictures in our S3 buckets. What we want to do, what we want to know about these images is uh, want to, to know some information about them. Uh, how good are these images? Um, because as mentioned earlier, for people who want to buy things, it's very important to have a, a good picture to get uh, a good impression of how the item might look like uh, and uh, decide whether they want to uh, contact the seller or not. And if a picture is good, then it maximizes the chances that they will decide to actually uh, contact the seller and uh, buy the item eventually. So on, uh, here we have two pictures. Uh, one picture is better quality, the other picture is a bit worse. So we want to know which pictures are good, which pictures are bad. And in case a picture is not uh, 
the best quality we want to contact the seller uh, and suggest some ways to to improve the image and the overall listing then we are also interested in uh, what uh, what is it on these images what are the objects on these images um, as you see there are many many things that people can post and upload um, bikes cars um, sometimes people can um, upload something they want to they can try to sell something that uh, they aren't supposed to sell like uh, a weapon we also want to know that um, so in this case we, we have a uh, somebody is trying to sell a machete, of course, and this is... We should prevent this from happening. Um, so we, from images, we want to know what is on the image. So for each image, we want to know whether it's an image of a truck, whether it's an image of a fridge, or it's uh, an image of some web. Um, so the idea is simple. So how can we extract this information? Of course, using machine learning and deep learning. So we get all these images that we have uh, send them to uh, to machine learning model and then uh, store the output somewhere in a, in a database so this can be a metadata database where, and all these labels all these categories uh, are the fields in this database basically the information about each image um, so the plan is clear we want to use machine learning how do we actually uh, train models. So train models is quite uh, simple these days. There are many services, cloud services, that make uh, the job a lot easier than a few years ago. Um, we use Amazon SageMaker. With SageMaker it's quite simple. So all we need to do is upload the data to S3 and run a SageMaker job. The SageMaker job uh, gets the data from S3 trains a model with the parameters we specify and saves the results. So it looks uh, like that. So we have a way to collect uh, the data. So it can be our own service for labeling or we can also use um, Amazon Mechanical Turk. And then um, for each image we know, um, for example, image quality, how good the image is. Um, we get all this data and save to S3. And in S3 we have the actual images plus the labels. Uh, then we can run a SageMaker job. SageMaker job fetches the images from S3, um, trains a model, and then saves the results uh, again to S3 as a model file. Quite simple. Um, and we can have a model in no time. So let's say we spend uh, some time, a week, to uh, training the model. We have it. The model is quite good. What's next? Um, what we can do next is, uh, for example, since we use SageMaker for training, we can also use SageMaker for model serving. So what we want to do is uh, just take this model and put it inside a SageMaker endpoint. But then uh, we actually not. We don't just want to put this model uh, to an endpoint. We want to get all the images that we have in S3, uh, run them through the model and save the results in metadata database, uh, such that the users uh, can benefit from this. Um, so we need a way to to get images, put them to model, save the results and make the user happy. Uh, so now we'll talk uh, about how to actually do this. Uh, to do it, we create a special service called Metadata Service that um, uh, clients of this service, uh, that is typically other, the other teams that need uh, the predictions of uh, our models, they communicate to this. This Metadata Service uh, talks to a model wrapper. This is a simple, uh, very simple service that um, simply fetches images from S3 and then it gets the images and then sends them to SageMaker. SageMaker processes the images, returns the predictions, uh, then this model wrapper returns predictions again to metadata service, metadata service saves the results to database and responds to the user. Now the user can use um, can use these predictions to do whatever, whatever they want. And uh, 
the first initial version was quite good so we could already uh, analyze the quality of images that we had and uh, somehow educate our users that in cases that um, image is not uh, good we can say what is wrong with the image and suggest ways to improve it but there were some problems with um, our initial architecture first of all SageMaker turned out to be um, quite expensive uh, if we when we simply deploy it to our own Kubernetes cluster instead of using SageMaker endpoint we could reduce um, costs like four times then the next step uh, we noticed that it's quite difficult to um, to deal with uh, spikes of traffic when we have sudden spikes spikes of traffic uh, when uh, during um, during some days suddenly a lot of users try to upload images then to gracefully scale up and scale down um, we added a bit of uh, we made our service asynchronous so we basically added a, a queue between the metadata service and model wrapper and with this queue we can it was a lot easier to actually scale uh, our models because we didn't need to process everything immediately we could just wait a bit uh, and then simply uh, uh, scale our models up and then process uh, through peaks of traffic um, we had two models so basically for each of the model uh, we had um, a special thing uh, that we previously called model wrapper for each model we had a, a separate one which could fetch images from S3 and then talk to uh, TensorFlow serving or um, MMX, uh, MXNet server s serving and process models. So let's um, walk through the process. So first, a client sends, uh, submits uh, a request. So it can be, for these files, I want to know the category uh, of the objects on these uh, images so it means we want to run a classification model then the metadata service uh, responds immediately saying that your request is in queued wait we'll tell you when it's finished um, now metadata service checks the database to see if we already have some results uh, for some of the files if we don't we submit uh, this request to a queue then the image category uh, model wrapper listens to this queue pulls messages from there uh, typically does this in batches of uh, 10 image 10 images gets the images uh, from s3 and then the, does some pre-processing because we need to get the images resize them convert to numpy array do some pre-processing like um, uh, normalize the, the arrays then eventually it uh, takes the arrays and converts them to protobuf once we have protobuf we use gRPC to talk to TensorFlow Serving. Uh, we send a request, TensorFlow Serving replies with results again over gRPC. Um, and then the model wrapper puts the results uh, to the response queue. Metadata service listens to this queue, um, gets the results, saves them to the database, and then finally responds to, to the client. And this is uh, using a callback saying hey for these IDs uh, these are the categories and this worked uh, quite well um, so we could uh, use these things uh, these models for uh, for many use cases like one I already mentioned um, detecting the images with uh, uh, not great quality and then suggesting the sellers ways to improve it and the other case was moderation uh, when somebody is trying to sell something they are not supposed to sell we could uh, catch these images and uh, not let them go live to the platform there were unfortunately some drawbacks in this architecture so um, this was pretty inconvenient for the clients because uh, when a system is asynchronous it makes uh, it quite difficult to uh, to uh, to work with this instead of just simply saying uh, sending request and getting a response they need to also keep track of uh, 
output was what uh, the requests and then also provide a callback so it, they, it means that they need to make the uh, service publicly available to, to make this endpoint so it's a bit uh, difficult for the clients um, then it's also not really real time because in some cases when we have uh, peaks of traffic it's difficult to let's say at the same time 10,000 users um, uploaded the images. So of course there will be some delay in uh, working through this backlog um, of images and uh, it means that if somebody is trying to sell a gun at this point uh, we might need to wait 5 or sometimes 10, minute, 10 minutes before we can actually uh, catch this case and remove the ad. Um, in these cases we of course want to uh, react real in real time and already know about um, guns uh, th at the moment they are uploaded to the platform. And it's uh, also too much uh, synchronous, uh, like we need to to have a lot of queues and just following through um, the system to see how requests are propagating is sometimes quite difficult. It's also expensive, we use um, SQS for the queues and uh, it works uh, through polling so the the clients who uh, the services who listen on the queue uh, they um, uh, simply ask the queue hey are there new messages are there new messages and they keep doing this um, of course there is some delay but eventually uh, for each request we have to, to pay a certain amount of money and then um, at some point half of the costs for of the infrastructure was just simply uh, uh, SQS polling. That was too expensive. Then we also had some duplicated logic uh, because um, these model wrappers they both need to talk to S3, do some pre-processing um, so when creating these services we need to somehow put this logic in the library. It was a bit difficult to maintain. Um, then database that we have uh, was not good for analytics. Um, we can of course store the results there and use them for uh, responses, but uh, uh, when people wanted to analyze the results of the models uh, we couldn't simply use that for that. And we also, also used MySQL and with uh, our traffic we found out pretty fast that um, just grows too much and it's uh, a bit of a burden to maintain it to make sure that uh, the database is not overloaded it has sufficiently large instance and things like that and finally when we need to add a new model it turns out that there are too many places where we need to uh, that we need to modify so when we want to add a third model we need to change something in the metadata service we need to add um, two more queues we need to create a new service um, for the wrapper, uh, we need to put some logic there for getting the files from S3, um, then uh, put this to TensorFlow Serving or MMS. Um, so it's a lot of uh, work to just add a new model. Um, that's why we try to make it a bit simpler. This is something I'll talk about now. Um, so this is what we have, and we try to see how we can improve it. So the first step uh, that we did was to to get all these model wrappers and put them into one service. So now we don't have multiple services, it's just one thing. Uh, and we called it image model service, because this thing contained the logic for getting the data from uh, S3, processing the images, and then talking to TensorFlow serving uh, to the actual models. Uh, with this setup we no longer needed the metadata service and all these queues uh, and uh, the client simply could uh, send a HTTP request to, uh, to IMS itself. Uh, and then we weren't uh, happy about MMS. MMS is um, MXNet uh, model service so that's why we also removed it. And uh, with this our architecture becomes quite simple. So in retrospect, like right now it seems quite easy. Uh, so this is in retrospect what we should have started with. 
just a simple thing that uh, accepts requests uh, and then forwards them to actual models. Um, of course, we need to have a caching layer on top of that to make sure that we don't uh, we don't uh, uh, score our images multiple times. And the way we do it, we use um, DynamoDB, a key value store. And for the key, instead of using the file name, we use MD5 hash of the file. Uh, we have quite a few duplicates on our platform. People often uh, upload the same image multiple times. So in this case, we don't want to, to send it, uh, to score it again uh, and send it to the model. We can see that for this MD5 hash, we already have results and we can simply return to the user immediately. Uh, we don't need to calculate MD5 hash. We can simply use etag from S3 uh, because their etag in most cases is the same as MD5 hash. Then we needed to add a few more models. So the first model was detecting if there is a uh, artificially embedded text on the pictures. Um, in some cases, it's prohibited on our platforms to, to add this text. So we want to have a model that detects that it's the case and uh, help uh, us remove this from the platform. So there was another model that simply checks if there is text or not. Adding this model was quite simple. So we didn't need to touch many uh, places. So we just needed to, to adjust the code of MS to add a new pre-processing class uh, for this. Um, and add another instance of uh, TensorFlow serving with this model. Then we had another problem uh, that we also wanted to solve with deep learning. It was uh, we wanted to detect nudity. Um, um, so we trained another model uh, for classifying if an image is safe for work or not. So that was another model. We used the MaxNet for that. Again, trained using um, uh, SageMaker. Uh, and for that, we uh, wrote our own MXNet uh, serving uh, because we didn't like MMS. So we wrote a simple thing, um, uh, simple wrapper around MMX, uh, MXNet that can get uh, a, a compressed uh, NumPy array, unpack it, uh, apply the model, and return back the response. Something pretty similar to TensorFlow serving, but instead of using Pradabuff, it used HTTP. Um, that was the, our final architecture. So it was quite simple. Um, one caveat here was that uh, tuning it was more difficult than in asynchronous case. Because when we have asynchronity, we can gracefully react to peaks in traffic. Uh, when there is a sudden, uh, uh, sudden peak, uh, 10,000 images are uploaded. Uh, we can simply put them to the queue and uh, scale it out uh, uh, and then process through the backlog and then scale it down. And we don't need to worry that something gets lost. Here we need to be more uh, careful uh, with this uh, because uh, if we are synchronous and need to respond immediately, it means that uh, to react to these peaks of traffic we need to uh, sometimes over provision instances. So some, to have some instances that are idle and when, once they started, uh, once they start receive traffic, we add more instances. And this way we can, uh, uh, react to peaks of traffic with, uh, with less problems. But it's again, uh, it took uh, quite a while to actually tune it, uh, to be able to, to process, uh, through a lot of requests at the same time. With asynchronous case, it was easier. Um, and then just one last thing is uh, we have analysts and analysts are quite interested in analyzing the results of uh, these predictions. Um, and of course, uh, they often want to, to, to see how many images, for example, contain text or how images were pornographic or how images contained guns or things like this how many cars were there among the images. Uh, with the previous setup, it was difficult. And uh, let's briefly talk about how we made it easier for analysts. Um, so the moment uh, a user uploads an image to S3, 
um, S3 can uh, generate a S3 event notification saying, hey, there was a file in the bucket, do something with this. And it's possible to put these uh, notifications to, to a queue. And then what we can do is we can simply listen to this queue, to all the events, uh, uh, to all the new newly uploaded images, and then um, simply send them to IMS, to our image model service. Then model service responds with results. We can put it to results, to a kinesis stream in our case, and then eventually save it to S3. When we have the data in S3, we can uh, simply um, put them to glue catalog and have the data in Athena tables. Uh, Athena is uh, uh, is basically a managed uh, SQL engine, a Presto, and you can use it to query all the results. So analysts could use SQL, uh, a tool they, they know and love, to query the results um, of our models, and they were very happy about this. Uh, that uh, was it. So we talked about uh, motivation, why we wanted to to build um, our uh, model server, um, why we needed to serve deep learning models, when we briefly talked uh, about how we trained models, and then discussed our um, architecture for doing this. Uh, just want to summarize uh, all the talk into the main uh, takeaway points. So we use deep learning to extract metadata from images. Uh, that is uh, a couple of models, and then we run them and save the results in uh, the metadata database. Um, we use AWS SageMaker, and it makes it very easy to to train deep learning models. We simply need to specify the location with the data, the parameters of the model, uh, press a button, and then it um, trains a model and saves the results to S3. Uh, serving with SageMaker is uh, not as nice as training, so it still need it requires a bit of code to actually get the images from S3, process them uh, in the way we need, and then it gets a bit expensive uh, at scale when we need to process a lot of images at the same time. Uh, working through uh, a lot of uh, images uh, through peaks of traffic is easier when uh, the system is asynchronous, but there is a downside of that, that they are more complex, they are more inconvenient for the users, and then they are not always real-time, because uh, when there is a backlog of items in the queues that we need to, to process, it may take some time to, to process all the items. Um, we used S3 event notifications mechanism uh, as a, a non-intrusive way to connect uh, our systems, uh, to connect all the images, our image hosting from the image hosting, and then process them and uh, put the results to, to the Athena table. And uh, that made it a lot easier for analysts to analyze all the results. Um, and then finally, uh, Athena is uh, quite an easy to maintain solution for analytics. It's scalable, you pay only for uh, uh, the data you scan, um, and uh, you simply can put all the data in S3 and uh, let uh, analysts play with the data. That is almost all from my side. So um, this uh, talk is based on uh, two blog posts in our Blog. You can uh, go there and read for uh, for more details, for more information. There's also in the part two a bit. Uh, uh, there are some details about the way we serve MXNet models. So if you're interested, go check it. And then uh, finally, uh, I am working on a book called Machine Learning Bootcamp. 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 The idea is to teach machine learning uh, through projects. Um, if you're interested, uh, go check the link uh, and you can get a um, 40% discount with uh, um, the code here. Um, I will appreciate if you uh, give me any feedback on the talk, uh, if you find it interesting or maybe it was too slow or too fast. Um, so if you 
want to do it, you can uh, check this QR code or this link and give me some feedback. Also, there uh, you'll find the, uh, the link to the slides. And you can also, if you're interested in uh, a free copy of Machine Learning Bootcamp, Bootcamp leave your um, address, email address, and you get a chance to, to win a free copy. This is all from me. Thank you for your attention. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. I'll be very happy to answer them. Thank you.